The other night, the kids and I were at home alone. Anita was gone. And it came time for dinner. That's a pretty unpredictable moment in our family when I'm at home alone with the kids and it's dinner time. I went to the refrigerator and opened the refrigerator and surveyed the contents. Normally what I do is, at a moment like that, is survey the contents and then turn and make a profound statement to the kids. Kids, can you pronounce Chipotle? (laughs) But this evening was different. This was a special evening. This was going to be different. So I looked at what was in the refrigerator and decided I'm going to fix a dish that you've probably never eaten. It goes by a French name pronounced leftovers. <laughs> it's quite a dish. And so I got the things ready and fixed the meal. It took a little time to fix the meal. Three minutes according to the microwave timer. And then we gathered there and we served our plates and we had a prayer. And then we had a decision to make. Normally we would sit right there on the, in the breakfast nook at the table. But this was a different evening, a special evening And so we had a conversation, and the kids were pretty much in agreement that God created TiVo for moments just like that. And Miranda said, there is a TV show, Daddy, that I want you to see. I recorded it. I said, okay, well, we'll watch it. So we sat down, and we ate, and we watched me for the only time, the first time, a television show called Undercover Boss. Now, the premise of the show is really quite simple. Find a multi-million dollar company that has a boss or an owner who is willing to go in disguise and come to the company with the lowest of the low, the jobs right at the bottom of the totem pole, see if he or she can get hired on, and see how they treat him or her. And then at the end of the show, of course, there is the inevitable disclosure. This actually was the owner of the company. The evening we watched, Todd Ricketts, co-owner of the Chicago Cubs, decided to go undercover, and so he was hired. He was hired as part of the stadium crew. The cover story was this. You're going to go in there, and you're going to tell them you're in need of a job. The reason the TV cameras are following you around is that you're trying out for a number of different jobs, seeing which one will stick. We're trying to do a story on that. And so he was hired on a temporary basis. He started with the gentleman who cleaned the bathrooms. It was a tough job. It had to be done well, and it had to be done quickly. Ricketts was told very specifically, you've got to get this done quickly. There are so many bathrooms. We only have a certain amount of time. You've got to move, move, move. Well, he didn't have it in him to move, move, move. He got into real trouble. So much so that at the end of the day, this gentleman looked at him and said, well, I'm sorry to tell you, you're just not cutting it. I'm going to have to let you go. And he fired him, just right there. Well, they weren't quite done with Ricketts yet, so they said, well, we'll try some other things. You'll work on another part of the stadium crew. So he became one of the people who sold the hot dogs. That didn't go so great either. In fact, it went so poorly that at one point, when he thought no one was looking, he dumped a bunch of the hot dogs in the trash can and slipped his own 20 in the pile of bills. Maybe that'll work. (laughs) Didn't go too well with the hot dogs. And so then he tried working as a parking lot attendant. That didn't go so well. And finally with part of the field crew, getting the field ready for the game. Well, to make a short story even shorter, things didn't go that well. And then came the end. Now the different people who worked at Wrigley Field with the Cubs were told, you're going to come in, you're going to make one final appearance with this gentleman, and you're going to explain to him what he needs to do in order to do better. So they agreed, and they came in, and it was all taped. The only thing was, it was at that moment in time that they chose to divulge who this person actually was. It was a frightening moment for those people who worked on the crew. In fact, the gentleman who cleans the bathrooms, who had fired Ricketts, when he was told, this is actually Todd Ricketts. He's one of the owners of the Chicago Cubs. His eyes got big, his eyebrows arched, and he said, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Scary moment. So what did Ricketts say to them? What did he say specifically to that gentleman who had fired him? Well, before I answer that question, 
I want to take you to another scene. It's another scene where somebody encounters someone at first not quite sure what to make of them. Her eyes must have grown large, her eyebrows arched, and she must have in her soul said, uh-oh, what happened there? You know the story. It is contained in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. I invite you to take your Bibles and to turn to Luke 1. In Pew Bibles, it's page 1522. It's an old, old story. It's a story to which we return every year at this time of the year, and yet somehow it never quite grows old. It's the story of an angel who appeared to a young maiden named Mary and gave her some unbelievable news. Mary was young. Mary was unmarried. Mary was proper. And when you're young and unmarried and proper and you know social protocol, the news that this angel delivers is not good news. It's very frightening news indeed. She must have felt her heart skip. She must have let slip an audible, uh-oh. But actually, if you read in the TNIV, which we are about to read, Luke says that she was greatly troubled. So let's read the account, Luke chapter 1. We begin with verse 26. Luke writes, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born of you will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. It's a strange story. A strange story. Did you listen as we read through the story? Did you think, what a strange account? There are a number of strange elements in the story. Start, first of all, with the context of the story. The story that just ended, the one we considered last week, is the story of a woman past her childbearing years told, you will be with child. Women at that age don't have babies. Doesn't the angel know that? So that's strange enough. But that's not all, not by a long shot. Right at the beginning of this account that we read today is another strange reality. Did you notice what the text said? The angel Gabriel, this is the angel who, according to his own admission, stands in the presence of God. The angel Gabriel was sent to Nazareth. Nazareth. Really? Nazareth? A backwater town in Galilee, Nazareth. Some would call it the backwash of Palestine, Nazareth. Did you know that Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament? Did you know that Nazareth is not mentioned in the Talmud? Did you know that Nazareth does not appear on the list that Josephus made of 204 cities in Galilee? Nazareth is not there. To say that Nazareth is somehow an obscure village is something like saying Everest is somewhat of a tall mountain. Nazareth? Really? The angel Gabriel sent there? Are you saying to me that the universal focus of attention is honed in on this backwater, obscure village? 
That's like going home and flipping on the evening news broadcast and have the news broadcaster say, today the President of the United States of America rushed with urgency to a most important meeting in Minto. Mentone? The President of the United States? Nazareth, are you kidding me? Universal attention focus there? Strange. But that's not the last strange thing. Do you count it as strange that when the angel comes, he comes to talk to Mary? almost certainly between 12 and 14 years of age. We might say it, Mary, sweet 16 and never been kissed. Mary, Mary, who's never been out on a date. That Mary, he comes to Mary and he says to her, Mary, you are with child. And Mary says, I haven't even been out to eat with a man. How can I be with child? Strange. It's a strange story when you read it. But that's not the end of the strangeness. Do you want to hear something really strange? Did you notice the greeting of the angel to Mary? The angel appears to Mary and says, Hail, you who art high, highly favored. God has found favor with you. He repeats it twice. Mary must have looked over her shoulder to figure out who the angel was talking to. Me? Are you talking to me? You see, every culture, every society has its forms and its formulas for how we talk to people, how we greet them. Have you noticed that? We saw it several years ago. We were privileged to be in London at that time. We had worshipped that morning at All Souls Church in London. After lunch, with some friends, we had the privilege of going to the parsonage several blocks away. Now, the parsonage really had two divisions. In one part of the parsonage lived the then-current rector of all souls named Richard Buse. In the other part of the parsonage lived the rector emeritus named John Stunt. We had had the opportunity to see them both and speak with them both in the morning, but now we went over there in the afternoon and knocked on the door. They had seen and spoken with each other just that morning. They lived next door to each other. And yet I was struck as John Stott and Richard Buse saw each other again that day, how proper their greeting was. They shook hands. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, Richard. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? God is good. Very proper, very British, very nice. It got me to thinking, what would it be like if I, just this afternoon, having seen other pastors here at the worship service this morning, what would be more reality in our culture if I were to run into one of my colleagues on the pastoral staff? Suppose, for example, this afternoon I ran into Rob Moore. Actually, that's not a real good one to choose. Let me choose a different one. <laughs> Suppose this afternoon I ran into Daryl Retzer. It would probably go something like this. Say, hi, Daryl. He'd say, hi, Randy, as we passed each other and went on about our affairs. More informal. It's okay. Different cultures have different ways in which they greet one another. Understand that what the angel says to Mary is a greeting that would have been reserved for a person of high status and high standing. Hail, you who are favored by God. Here's how one commentary puts it. It says, as both a woman and as a young person not yet married, Mary had virtually no social status and neither the title, favored or graced one, nor the promise, the Lord is with you, was traditional in greetings, even had she been 
a person of status. In other words, not only is the greeting for someone of status, but it even goes beyond that. Hail you who are favored by God. You have found favor with God. No wonder Luke records the words. And Mary was greatly troubled at that greeting, wondering just exactly what does that greeting mean? Are you talking to me? Strange. It's a story with so many strange elements contained therein. But the angel is talking to her. Mary, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It gets me to thinking, is Mary the only one in that room who is afraid? The well-known writer Frederick Beekner writes about this encounter, this exchange between the angel and Mary. And what he writes, he writes as though from the perspective of Gabriel, the angel. So listen to what Beekner writes, as though you are looking at things from Gabriel's perspective. Beekner's words, she struck him as hardly old enough to have a child at all let alone this child. But he had been entrusted with a message to give her, and he gave it. He told her what the child was to be named, who he was to be, and something about the mystery that was to come upon her. You mustn't be afraid, Mary, he said. As he said it, he only hoped that she wouldn't notice that beneath the great golden wings, he himself was trembling with fear to think that the whole future of creation hung on the answer of a girl. Mary may not have been the only one afraid. Here is Gabriel from the presence of God in a backwater place called Nazareth, with a young woman with no social standing, not much more than a mere maiden. And he speaks the words of the message he has been given. And then he says, don't be afraid, Mary, just because the future of humankind rests on your shoulders just because the focus of an entire universe is honed in on your face, just because God's eternal plan of salvation is nestled in your womb, Mary, don't be afraid. Have no fear. Are you kidding me? Strange. Very strange. But that's what he says. He says, don't be afraid, Mary. It's the second time here in Luke's gospel that the angel has spoken to a trembling human being and said, don't be afraid. The first time was the previous passage, the one we saw last week. Zechariah, the priest in the temple, the angel appears. He's gripped with fear. Don't be afraid. Now today, Mary going about the common daily duties of her life. The angel appears. She is greatly troubled. He says, don't be afraid. It is tempting because of that to think that these, these two scenes are very similar, very much the same. But be careful. Eugene Peterson points out just how different they are. The first happened to a man. The second to a woman. The first to an old man. The second to a young woman. The first to a priest, a member of the clergy. The second to a lay person, not in any religious order. The first happened in the sacred place of worship. The second happened in the round of daily duties. The first said, there will be a woman beyond childbearing years who will be with child. The second said, there will be a young woman before she has ever known a man who will be with child. It's as though God and God through Luke points out to us the entire spectrum of human experience. Could it be, could it be that God is simply trying to say there is no one in any place, 
at any time, of any age, of either gender, of any station in life, no matter where you find yourself on the human spectrum, there is no one who is beyond the reach of the Christmas miracle. There is no one who is beyond the reach of the words, don't be afraid, you have found favor with God. Could it be? After all, words very similar to these, very similar, appear in at least one other place in the New Testament, the first chapter of the letter to the Ephesians. Very similar words appear there. And in that context, they are not spoken just to a young maiden. They are spoken to anyone who will listen. In that context, they say that God's grace has been freely bestowed upon us in the one whom he loves. In other words, if you wish to receive it, you have found the favor of God. Do you understand that? Do you understand that in this context the angel appears to Mary and says, Mary, you have received the Christmas miracle and to you that specifically means that Jesus will be born of you. But that today the angel's message can come to you as well and say to you, today the Christmas miracle comes to you because Jesus can be born in you, of her, in you. That's the message of God's grace. You have found favor with God. It is freely bestowed upon you in the one he loves. The grace of God. It's a strange story. It seems strange at almost every stop along the way. Strange because of the context, an old woman going to have a child. A young woman going to have a child. Strange because a backwater town, nobody would go there, the center of attention. Strange for so many reasons. But maybe strange for no greater reason than this. In this story is contained the kernel of the truth that will become the gospel. That truth that says no one in any place at any time is beyond the reach of the favor of God. People who most do not deserve it, the most undeserving people, can receive the message of that angel. And yet maybe you say, oh, no, no, please. You don't know me. You don't know what I struggle with, the sin in my life, the times I have failed, my cold, hard heart. You don't know me. True, I don't. But I know the angel's word. And I know a little bit from this book about the heart of God. And I know that God loves you. God desires relationship with you. God believes in you. That I do know. In 2002, the story was remade into film. Had been so a number of times before. That 19th century French novel written by Alexandre Dumas called The Count of Monte Cristo. In the telling of the story, one is drawn in and gripped with what happens. Edmond Dantes a young man, innocent, is framed by three of his so-called friends with friends like these who needs enemies. And as a result of that, he winds up as a prisoner in the most dreaded of the French prisons, the Chateau d'If. There he is in prison for 13 long years, and there in that prison, his heart grows hard and cold as stone within him, and all he can think about is escaping and wreaking vengeance on those who sent him to this place. But he meets another prisoner, a priest named Abbe Faria. Abbe Faria takes young Edmund under his wing and begins to teach him. He teaches him literature and mathematics. He teaches him philosophy. He teaches him theology. He becomes a very important part of Edmund's spiritual journey. But as they collude together, they are thinking of escape. 
And so they begin to dig. They begin to tunnel through the ground, hoping to be able to reach the edge of the island and thereby make their escape. They have made great progress until that day comes that there is a cave-in. And in the cave-in, Abbe Faria is mortally wounded. He finally lies, dying on the floor of his cell. And it is there that Edmund and Abbe Faria have their final conversation. While choking and gasping for air, wincing in pain, the priest says to him, Edmund, I lied. I lied. When they asked me about the treasure of Sparta, I lied. I know where it is. And Edmund pulls back and says, you lied? And the priest says, look, I'm a priest, not a saint. I lied. And then he tells Edmund, how to find the treasure. When you escape, he gives them the map and tells them, this is where you will find the treasure. And Edmund takes that map and he says, then I will get my revenge. But the priest says to him, no, Edmund, no. You must not go out and commit the crime for which you now serve the sentence. No, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Leave it in God's hand. And Edmund says, I don't believe in God. And then the priest says, Ah, Edmund, but he believes in you. Those words remind me of the words of the angel. I don't know what our words would be, Edmund's words were, I don't believe in God. The Abbey's words were, but he believes in you. Mary's words were, how can this be? And the angel's words were, you have found favor with God. What would your words be? Would they be, but I'm a great sinner. You don't know my struggles. Or would they be, I'm a nobody. There are so many other people more deserving, more talented, more gifted. Surely God isn't coming to me. Or maybe your words would be, I've been a church member for many years, but inside my heart is stony cold. I don't know what your words would be. But I think I know what God's words would be in response. They were words a great deal like the words I heard just the other night. The words of Todd Ricketts, as he sat there across that table from that bathroom cleaning worker who had fired him. That worker who upon hearing who Ricketts was had large eyes and arched eyebrows and said, uh-oh, I know what Ricketts' words were. He looked across the table at that worker and he smiled. And he said, well, he said something like this. He said, you don't have to be afraid. I'm not out to get you. I have something very good I want to give you. When I heard Ricketts' words, I thought of the angel. And when I read the angel's words, I thought of you.